Well, good morning and welcome to worship at Winnetka Heights. Uh, let me begin with an announcement and I'm excited about this one. I am thrilled that we are going to get back together and start worshiping on Sunday, May 31st. So Sunday, May 31st, I'm excited about that. Uh, just stay tuned. Uh, we'll be just sending out word a variety of ways, primarily through our Facebook page. But between now and then, you'll hear more about specifics just as we kind of assess what's going on in the city and in the state. Just listen to the government and the experts and some things like that. But, uh, but we're already looking towards that, and I'm excited about that. Just wanted to let you know about that. And so uh, Sunday, May 31st, hope you're ready for that. Uh, let me also just thank you, uh, so many of you that have just continued to give to our church, continue to give to the gospel work as we are just part of Jesus Christ's Great Commission. So thank you for doing that. Let me just remind you to be faithful to that. As always, you can just old-fashioned write out a check to Winnetka Heights and just put that in the mail. We get that here at the church. Uh, you could also use our app through PayPal. And so just either way, however you'd like to do it, uh, we appreciate that. But more importantly, God does. Uh, it's just something that where you know that that's part of God's will for your life and you can rest in the fact that he will bless you for doing that. And so with that, I now call you to worship officially. So there in your living room, whether you're alone or with your spouse or your whole family gathered together, uh, just take control of the next several minutes as you worship. Yet again, this is God's will for your life. He will bless you for this. I need this time of worship. You need this time of worship. Our church family, even though we are separated physically right now, we need to know that we're worshiping right now together, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And so I just invite you now to begin to think thoughts of worship. Just open your heart and your mind up to God as he meets you through his word and through your giving and through your singing and begins to do things in you that he knows that you need. All right. So we know that we need this. We're going to hear from God through his word. So I would invite you now to just take your Bible, open it up to the Old Testament book of Isaiah chapter 46. And, and this passage will be on the screen, but I think these are just some words that we need to remember and hear from God right now. So I'm going to be reading in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 11. Remember this. Fix it in your mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far-off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will will I do? Oh, wow. We, we human beings who think that we have everything figured out, have we not learned over the past couple of months? We don't have much figured out. We are still just sort of grasping and groping in the dark with regards to health and safety in our country and in the world. And, and we have now assembled in the presence of a holy God, a sovereign God, who knows the end from the beginning and is intimately involved in everything, including this virus. And so we want to just approach him humbly right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And we never want to go a step further in our worship service without just together acknowledging our sinfulness before God and openly admitting our need of Jesus Christ for forgiveness. And so I would just invite you now as we pray our prayer of confession together, the words will be on the screen, recite that audibly together there in your living room, wherever you are, and mean this from your heart. Gracious God, we confess that we have longed too much for the comforts of this world. We have loved the gifts more than the giver. In your mercy, help us to see that all things we pine for are shadows, but you are substance, that they are quicksands, but you are mountain, that they are shifting but you are anchor. We plead your forgiveness on the merits of Jesus Christ. Accept his worthiness for our unworthiness, his sinlessness for our transgressions, his fullness for our emptiness, 
his glory for our shame, his righteousness for our dead works, his death for our life. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that and you meant that, church, then receive the pardon of God the Father because of his son, Jesus Christ. What a great thing to be forgiven. And so now, just right there in your living room, I know it might sound kind of kind of awkward and maybe a little bit off-key, but who cares? Uh, I want you to just raise the roof, as I say every Sunday, uh, just join together in singing as Joseph and Pam come forward now and just lead us in some hymns of praise.
right, I think I could hear you singing all the way from here. <laughs> well, I would invite you to take your Bibles, if you uh, still have them there on your lap, open them up to Galatians chapter 5. So what do Americans prize more highly than anything? Freedom. Uh, we are the free people that we like to think that way. And, uh, and mostly when we think that way, we're thinking of political freedoms, such as the freedom of speech, uh, the freedom of religion, the freedom to vote. But mostly Americans want personal freedom, the freedom to be left alone, not having other people's values or ideas or styles of life forced on us. And the reason that we're like this is because we're naturally selfish. That's what we are. We're selfish creatures. Uh, we want to do what we want to do whenever, however, and with whomever we please. And if this is what freedom means, then believing in God becomes extremely inconvenient. If there is a God, he undoubtedly has opinions about what you ought to do and where you ought to do it and with whom. What many Americans want, therefore, is really not freedom of religion, but freedom from religion. But as we've learned here in Galatians, freedom from religion, well, that's not freedom at all. That's just another form of bondage. You should always ask what is meant by freedom. Whether freedom is worth having or not depends upon what kind of freedom that it is. Gospel freedom is the theme of the rest of Paul's letter to the Galatians. And he announces his theme in the first verse of the fifth chapter when he says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Now, gospel freedom scares legalistic religious leaders to death. Martin Luther, for instance, he preached gospel freedom. And the Pope, the Pope said that, that Luther was going to unleash a horde of law-breaking hooligans on society. There's always the fear that sinners will hear that the only thing they've got to do to get right with God is believe in Jesus. And, and then they're going to go out and just live for the devil, live any old way they want. At first glance, gospel freedom really does seem to remove all of the incentives to live a holy life. And that's why, over the centuries, churches have, man, they just felt the need to tone down the radical claims of the gospel. But they trade away gospel freedom for a message that tries to stop people from living any old way they want. And for all those reasons, today's text, it's, our passage today is a critical message. Paul shows us that gospel freedom leads us to obey God, not please ourselves. And he begins with the declaration that you are set free for freedom. He says in verse 1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Well, set free from what? Well, from our old slaveholders, sin, death, and the devil. Every human being is born into that triple slavery. We are born in sin, thus we're evil by nature, and therefore we're destined to die. And all along the way, we are tormented by the devil who tempts us to sin and just tries to drag us down to the pit of hell. True freedom, then, well, it's not doing what you want. It's not being left alone. It's not self-fulfillment. It's not political independence. It's not social equality. True freedom means liberation from this triple slavery. Why then are Christians often beaten down people? Have you noticed that? Why are so many freed sons and daughters of God feeble in their religious strength? Why do they have such diminutive, depressive views of their stature before God? What's going on here? Well, on one hand, the devil deceives them. Never forget that the Apostle Peter warns, Be sober and watch, because your adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Another explanation is that many believers are just ignorant of the gospel. Or they forget to re-preach the gospel to themselves over and over. Remember, works righteousness is our default response as people. Give to get, work to earn. Gospel freedom is foreign to us. 
So you have to re-preach it to yourself over and over. Another reason so many Christians are beaten down, depressed people is that they go to legalistic churches and, and they hear gospel perversions just like the Judaizers were forcing off on the Galatians. And this is why Paul warns in the second part of verse 1, Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Legalistic preachers enslave people to works righteousness, just like a farmer hitches his ox to the yoke. And the ox just slaves away all day long. And the only thing that he receives at the end of a long day, a little bit of hay and some pasture. And after several years of that, well, guess what? He just gets sent right off to the slaughterhouse. If you seek your standing with God based on your works, you are yoked to slavery. Work as hard as you can. Work as honestly as you can. Spend the best of your strength working for God but do not expect a reward because you are just a slave to sin, death, and the devil. And slaves are miserable in this life and certainly miserable in the life to come. Paul is warning here that gospel freedom is very fragile. It, it, it can slip from your grasp if you submit again to a yoke of slavery. And, and plenty of preachers and churches are out there happy to re-enslave you. Slaves are not happy, peaceful people, which explains why so many Christians are emotionally unhappy. Well, what's the remedy? What's the remedy? Gospel freedom. Stand firm in it, Paul says. Luther offers up some great practical advice. Our conscience must be instructed and prepared beforehand that when we feel the accusation of the law, the terrors of sin, the horror of death, and the wrath of God, we may remove these heavy sights and fearful fantasies out of our mind and set in place thereof the freedom purchased by Christ. Stand firm in the freedom that Christ freed you to enjoy. Stand firm in it. Well, Paul goes deeper in our second point with a word of exhortation. Don't Sever yourself from Christ and fall away from grace. The Galatians were facing an either-or decision. Would they make Christ their treasure or would they re-enslave themselves to law-keeping? And Paul told them that if they embraced the Judaizers' teaching, they could not be saved. Verse 2, look I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, that's what the Judaizers were pushing. It represented law-keeping. Christ will be of no advantage to you. So circumcision involved cutting off the male foreskin. In the Old Covenant, this was a way of saying that a Jew was separated from the world. But it was also a way of saying that, that he, if he ever rejected God, well, he himself would be cut off from God's people. And so here, Paul tells the Galatians just the opposite. They belonged to the new covenant, the one ratified by Jesus' blood, not to the old. And so if they got circumcised now, they would be cutting themselves off from Christ. And so the underlying principle is this. If you try to justify yourself before God on the basis of your works, you will just totally lose access to Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 4, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Now, he's not making a comment here about eternal security. That's not what he's talking about. Nobody who is truly united to Christ can ever lose his or her salvation. The Bible just consistently teaches that. What Paul means here is that it is possible for someone to be cut off from the community of God's grace, to just leave that community. Anyone who rejects the only salvation that Christ has to offer well, they got no business belonging to his church any longer. So 
anybody who goes back, it doesn't matter what you or anybody might have said, what your religious past might be, if you, I, or anyone goes back under the yoke of the law, because you're clearly never trusting in Christ alone for salvation, well, it just means you, me, or anybody who does that. Well, now we're outside the realm of grace. The Apostle Paul, or John rather, said of people like this, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. They didn't lose their salvation. They never trusted in Christ alone to begin with. And so they are now out side of the realm of grace. They fell away from it. They are now severed from Christ. That's what he's saying. You know, I've counseled with people through the years who struggle with the assurance of their salvation. And, and maybe you do. Maybe you have. Assurance of salvation is not possible if you think you must earn or even maintain your salvation by your efforts. That just makes sense. If you keep yourself saved by good living, well, how in the world are you ever going to know for sure that you're being good enough to retain God's favor? You can't. Which is why many Christians face the crippling fear that they might not be saved. Luther saw this in his ministry. I have seen many <clears throat> who painfully travailed and done as much as was possible for them to have done in fasting in prayer, in wearing of hair, in punishing and tormenting their bodies with sundry exercises, and all to this end that they might obtain quietness and peace of conscience. Notwithstanding, the more they travailed, the more they were stricken down with fear, and especially when the hour of death approached. They were so fearful that I have seen many murderers and other malefactors condemned to death dying more courageously than they did, who yet had lived with such attempts at holiness. Wow. If you have struggled with the assurance of your salvation, you have felt the emotional trauma that Luther saw those hundreds of years ago. And I hope you could see with crystal clarity that the clarity that God gives right here in Galatians and all through the Scripture is that Christians can know that they are safe and that they are saved. You didn't earn your salvation by your behavior, and you certainly can't unearn it by your behavior. However, we come to these verses, Christians need to hear. We Christians need to hear a warning in verses 2, three, four, two through 4. Paul is saying, if you decide that your salvation rests in any way on your performance, then you are denying salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, and you can't be saved by him. He's basically saying this is the acid test of whether someone's a Christian or not. And it's why circumcision was such a major issue to Paul, because he understood what was really at stake here was the justification of sinners. What makes a sinner like you or me right with God? And so getting circumcised was a way of saying that sinners have to do something to get right with God. Because either people are right and justified before God, partly by what they do with themselves, or they are justified exclusively by what Jesus Christ has done for them. And so when the Galatians were thinking about getting circumcised and following all the laws of the Old Testament... They're really thinking about how do I justify myself before God. Circumcision was a way of saying that Jesus Christ was not enough for them. They needed something more. Let me just ask you, what is your mode of justification? Because circumcision is just one alternative. We don't even think about it anymore. But it's just one alternative to faith alone in Christ alone. But there are a whole lot of other alternatives out there. Some people today base their standing before God on the work they do at the church. Praise God for people that come down and work at churches, but man, I tell you, you got to be very careful with that. Some people literally base their standing with God on how busy they are for God at the church. Some people base it on the quality or frequency of their personal devotions. Got to keep that thing going. 
Others depend on the decision they made for Christ, you know, way back when they walked down an aisle or raised their hand at, a, at an evangelistic rally, as if that gesture saved them. Still, others seek to justify themselves that they are baptized members of a church. Here's the thing. If, if you try to be justified before God by anything that you do, you're not free and you have fallen away from grace. And this is why justification must come by faith alone. The Puritan, I love this, William Perkins just simply said of Jesus, he must be a perfect Savior or no Savior. And if you don't let Christ do everything for you, he can do nothing for you. If you try to help yourself, Christ will be of no help to you. That makes me remember I read about a fella. He had an old baseball, and, and it had actually been autographed by Babe Ruth. He heard that this baseball might be very valuable because of that, so he decided to sell it one day, but he was worried because he got to looking at the ball, and he could see that the signature on it was very, very faded. So he wanted to make it clearer to make it more valuable. So he took out the ball and got a ballpoint pen and very carefully traced right over, you know, B A B E. R-U-T-T-H, Babe Ruth. He's so excited, you know. Well, but then he was just devastated when he learned that the effect of what he had done was to obliterate the real autograph. So that by the time he was finished, he had turned something that was literally almost priceless in the baseball world into something worthless. Nobody wanted it anymore. And it is exactly the same with Jesus Christ. His finished work cannot be refinished. It can only be destroyed. What Christ did on the cross and through the empty tomb must be received by faith alone. And if you try to add your works to his work, then his work will do you absolutely no good anymore. If you try to justify yourself, you are bound for hell. Christ can no longer do you any good if you sever yourself from him and fall away from grace. Paul has another exhortation, our third point, wait in faith. He says in verse 5, For through the Spirit, by faith, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Now notice that justification is not something we work for, it's something we wait for. God gives his righteousness to those who wait for it in faith. So the Lord Jesus Christ is returning, and you will be fully glorified on that day. Wait for that. It's sort of like your little child's birthday party. You know, a week or so before that, I mean, they are so pumped up. They, they can't stand it. They're beside themselves. You know, they know it's coming, and every day they're just, Mommy, Daddy, how much longer? How many more days? They can hardly wait. They know it's coming. They can't wait. And that's how God wants us to wait for that glorious day that we receive the full righteousness of Jesus Christ. We wait eagerly, waiting in faith for righteousness. And the righteousness we're waiting to receive, by the way, that is the perfectly right record, the perfectly wonderful relationship with God that is ours because of Jesus Christ. And you can live today in light of that, guaranteed future glorification, the welcome by God into his arms because you know that since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. I want you to think about that. No one else, and no secular person out there, no follower of any other religion that can look at their future like that. Non-religious people have no idea where they will be a million years from now, from now. And religious people, without the gospel, legalistic people, they are very, very anxious about where they're going to be someday. They can't relax. They can't look forward to the future with eager hope like you and I can. And I just want to remind you, believer, you can wait in faith. Paul has one more lesson for us, and this is a really important one. Fourth and finally, faith energizes love. 
So if you're a reader of Paul's letters, you know by now, man, he makes breathtaking statements. Verse 6 is another one. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. And Paul has two audiences in mind with this comment. And the first is non-Christians. He's saying that neither circumcision, representing a bunch of hard, strict religious duty, nor uncircumcision, representing just paganism, irreligion, loose, immoral living, neither of them count toward anything when it comes to establishing a relationship with God. So get that again. Neither strict moral exertion nor the loosest morality in the world counts. My friend and I were paddling a canoe on a roaring river several years ago, and, and we hit a swell on the upswing, and, and my friend bounced out to the left. And, and the canoe slammed back down, and I bounced out to the right. Now, if the canoe represents safety, well, it doesn't really matter which side we bounced out on. I mean, we were both in the water. We were both floating down that roaring river outside the safety of the boat. And I just want to tell you, if you fall out on the side of man-made religion, strict works righteous, righteousness, you're going to drown. You're going to go to hell. Or if you fall out on the side of irreligion, just loose morality, secular living, secular living, just live like you want, you're going to drown. You're going to go to hell. It just doesn't matter. Neither counts for anything when it comes to getting right with God. Your good performance does not make you right with God, nor does your bad performance make you any more lost or hopeless. Salvation is found in Christ alone, by faith alone. Now, the second audience that Paul has in mind is Christians. Christians. When he says that neither religion nor non-religion count, he means they don't count at all towards your standing with God. Now, think about that. When you string together several days, I mean of your best, Christian, right? I mean, you've been good. You've been successful. I mean, some good holy living going on in your life. Here's what you need to say to yourself when that happens. This success does not increase Christ's love for me. Now, the other side, when you fall down, because you're going to, and you experience a failure, because we do, you should say this to yourself. You know, if I had not failed in this way, that would not make me any more loved and accepted by God than I am at this very moment, this moment of your lowest. I mean, what a radical principle. This should lead to tremendous peace and balance in our Christian lives. It, this should eliminate all of the ups and downs that we're so prone to experience because we are all in circumcision, spiritual success, or uncircumcision, spiritual failure, all the time. That's just the life of us sinners. And Paul says that neither counts. Luther responds to this. This is a sweet and a sound consolation whereby consciences feeling their sins, may be greatly comforted. For the feeling of sin, the wrath of God, death, hell, and all other terrors is wonderfully strong in the conscience of some, as I myself do know by experience. I've always loved Luther's honesty. He just admitted his struggles and his doubts and his fears, just like the Apostle Paul did. But Luther knew what to do. He knew where to turn. Here's his advice, and it's great. Let us learn, therefore, in great terrors, when our conscience feels nothing but sin and judges that God is angry with us and that Christ has turned his face from us, not to follow the sense and feeling of our own heart, but to stick to the word of God, which says that God is not angry, but looks to the afflicted and such as are troubled in spirit. And Christ turns not himself away from such as labor and are heavy laden, but refreshes and comforts them. I can't think of anything more precious in all the world to a true child of God than this doctrine right here that we're looking at this morning. 
If you are a Christian, you can know that God is, I mean, most near to you, even when he feels to you like he is the furthest off. You can know that. He is a most merciful and most loving Savior when he seems to you and feels to you to be the most angry with you. Rest in this. Stick to this. Stand firm in this. This is what the Word of God says. Don't trust your heart in these things. Don't listen to the devil's accusations in these things. Don't follow the, your emotions in these things. Well, if neither circumcision nor circumcision counts for anything, well, it begs the question, what does? What does count? Paul concludes with the answer. Only faith working through love. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Faith literally energizes love. And really, that, that answers all of the naysaying legalistic skeptics in the church who try to tone down the radical claims of gospel freedom. They are scared to death that justification by faith alone will create a bunch of sin-loving church hooligans who are just going to live like the devil because they know they're going to just waltz right into heaven when they die. Listen, that's not just bad theology. That never happens among true Christians. Luther again who received this very accusation from the Pope, gave the reason why, based on verse 6. Although it be true that only faith justifies, it is not idle, but occupied and exercised in working through love. Inwardly, the Christian life consists in faith towards God, and outwardly, in love and good works toward our neighbor. Inwardly before God, who has no need of our works, and outwardly before men, whom our faith profits nothing, but who have need of our love and of our works. It's great. One of my sons said to me just last Sunday morning, right after we watched the sermon, he said, Dad, the gospel just seems too good to be true. Amen to that. Isn't that right? I mean, that God declares sinners like you and me to be perfectly righteous based only on our faith in Jesus Christ alone. We don't have to do anything to earn God's love. And we don't have to do anything to continue in his love. And it does seem too good to be true. And it's exactly why John Newton titled his famous hymn, Amazing Grace. Now here's the thing. For everyone, and I hope you're one of them, for everyone who is blown away by God's too-good-to-be-true gospel, well, they never take it for granted. We never take it for granted. We never get over God's grace. And people who never get over it, they never do what the Pope and what legalistic preachers say that they're going to do. They never see the gospel as a free ticket to go out and live a big old life of sin and then just waltz right into heaven when they die. No. Their faith energizes loving good works. The joy of their freely received salvation drives them then to do good for the sheer beauty of good, for the sheer delight of God, for the sheer love of others. Faith energizes love. Well, as we close, to just sort of put a wrap on this passage about gospel freedom, I would say that gospel freedom has two facets. There is conscience freedom. You are free from the guilt of your imperfect performance. Rest in God's love for you. And then secondly, there is motivational freedom. You are free from the old drive to perform you no longer need or want to follow the old pursuits as ways to just win your righteousness or to assure yourself of your worth before God. You can just now rest and you can let faith energize your love and you can now go out and love in response to what you have received. And our great God, as we close this passage, just Lord, thank you 
I thank you personally for this great doctrine. I pray on behalf of our church members that they'll just rest in being children, heirs of God. Gospel freedom frees our conscience. It frees our, frees our old motivations that we can just love and then just bask in. In being free. Enjoy being free. I can't say the word free enough. Free indeed. Free in Jesus. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.